now then you're welcome back so we're going to go through the Sunday papers very happy to say we have Vincent Hogan of the Irish Independent here in studio and Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times also here in studio you're both very welcome Thank you, good, good to see you. Up. So uh, a sense of the back pages, first of all, as you might imagine, Hamden Park dominates and it's pictured Troy Parrott. This is just after he missed that one-on-one -on -one chance last night. The win that got away is the headline in the Mail on Sunday. Ireland Rue missed chance for a crucial victory after failing to build on brilliant first half display. And then alongside that, Shane McGrath, Football League finals get a reprieve. So there was a meeting in uh, GA headquarters last night, the CCCC had been asked would they think about removing the uh, league finals, the four football finals, uh, but that's been defeated. The argument was made that the smaller counties uh, were very resistant to the idea of missing a rare chance to win a final at Crow Park. And another significant move as well, there's been talk for a long time of the GAA and the Camogie Association and the Ladies Football Association amalgamating well, in uh, a high-profile appointment, uh, Mary McAleese, former president of Ireland, has been appointed independent chairperson of that process to integrate the three bodies. Back page of the Mail on Sunday there. Sunday Independent, it's the uh, picture of Alan Brown flying through the air with uh, two hands in the air. And Ireland paid the penalty is the headline. Brown's uh, costly gaffe and Scott's valuable uh, victory. Daniel MacDonald, front page of the Sunday Independent. Similar headline, Sunday Times from Page, paying the penalty, and it's a picture of Brown with his uh, head in his hands. Ireland blow 1-0 lead as Scots win with late spot kick, and uh, Stephen Kenny here on that front page saying he didn't think it was a penalty. And then uh, peace will come to Mark Lawrence and BBC axed me for being 65 and white on the front page of the Sunday Times. Uh, Sunday Mirror Sport again, it's Alan Brown just after that penalty has been given. Now it's an arm wrestle, and they're talking there in the mirror about Tuesday's game against Armenia. Similar picture on the back of the sun. Alan Brown, hands in the air. Uh, shove handles is the headline. And uh, Stephen Kenny cried foul over the penalty that saw his team beaten at Hampton Park, says Neil O'Reardon. Uh, so Kenny said it's a contentious penalty, very harsh. And uh, he was looking back at it and he felt Brown was pushed and put his hands in the air to, I suppose, soften his fall. Sunday World... It's no can do for Ireland. Picture of Stephen Kenny there. Uh, Kevin Palmer. Stephen Kenny facing uh, fresh humiliation. Might be a touch strong in his uh, troubled reign as Ireland uh, manager after a 2-1 defeat against uh, Scotland in Glasgow. The, the fresh humiliation, to be fair to Kevin, would be if they lost to Armenia and were relegated on Tuesday evening from League B. And then uh, the star taking an English lead. Don't panic. Keynes played with three lines uh, now in crisis. So they are the back pages. Let's start with the main story there, which is Ireland and their 2 and defeat to Scotland. We have uh, various papers writing various things. Uh, your overall thoughts? Um, they played very well in the first half. Um, some Vinnie were talking about it afterwards, though, and as those freeze-frame pictures highlight, it's hard to dispute that penalty in the current climate of yeah. penalties and handballs, which I can't abide in football the way it's gone because I think most people in defending their own box now nearly need to have their arms tied behind their backs. I don't think but this you one need you to can't. have your hands that no, high to push the fall. No, Maybe absolutely. there. No, no, absolutely not. Not quite there. No, I think, I think as Vinny was saying inside, I don't think Kenny's helping himself by complaining too loudly. No, I, I think generally people who are being fair think they played well. They're actually quite an enjoyable team to watch now. Mm -hmm. um, I really like what I see with people like Obafemi, the explosiveness on a counter-attack. He really looks like he can do damage. Ogbene, likewise, when he comes in, he looks like he can be a game-changer. So we have a, a type of player that we haven't had historically that I really like. And I, and I think the back three mostly looked very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So... You can see that people are kind of reluctant to put the boot in to Stephen Kenny, even though this is now, I think, three wins in 20 competitive internationals, which is really lamentable figures. And this now will impact on our seeding for Euro 2020 <coughs> qualifying. But I don't think he helps himself by saying it was a contentious penalty. It, it clearly wasn't a contentious penalty. You've made the point, Joe, when you both your arms up above your head going towards a ball in your own penalty area, you're asking for trouble. And, if, and if, if Alan Brown was pushed, he was clearly pushed by John Egan, not by a Scottish player. So I think Stephen, Stephen doesn't need to go down that road. I think he has enough credit in the bank, which is a remarkable thing given they've won so few games. I think there is a, a freshness about how they're trying to play. And people are willing to kind of be more patient with this 
managerial setup, I think, than they have been historically with previous ones, Mick McCarthy's second coming, Martin O'Neill. There is a sense of trying to build something. And I've written this before. I, I think at least Stephen Kenny seems to stand for something. He seems to stand for a philosophy that I think is worth adhering to. Um, so I, I think really frustrating that they didn't get something out of that last night because their first half performance was absolutely outstanding. And then Troy Parrott has the, the miss when we set up by Obafemi. Um, but it was a game they shouldn't have lost. And it's another one that just got away from them. And that can't keep happening. Mm. So a uh, sense of what the papers are saying. Shane McGrath, Kenny is making Ireland better. He deserves our trust in the Mail on Sunday is their uh, lead opinion piece on it. So um, he makes the point that defeat can never return an A-plus result, but this was a game of extremely fine margins. And he says that as long as the side functions without a reliable goal score, it's always going to be a, a vulnerability in the setup. He says uh, of the Irish team, it's a group getting more accustomed to trying to keep the ball and squeeze their opponents but their most admirable trait coming from the manager is their courage. And he says, Kenny can be trusted to get on with the job. He is making Ireland better. Eamon Sweeney is, um, again, I think, as you said, Vincent, taking that nuanced view that we're almost not accustomed to in Irish football across <laughs> the decades. Sure. It's very, so he says, but he does hone in on the fact that the headline reflects it. The Irish have come up short in real tests. So he uh, opens by saying, Ireland should be doing better than this. Had someone predicted at the start of the Nations League campaign that the team were destined to dispute last place with Armenia while Scotland and Ukraine fought it out at the top, Stephen Kenny would have been highly offended at such a slight on his players. And yet that's just what's happened. He uh, argues Scotland are a long way ahead of us. Although he then, again, in that nuanced vein, says this does not mean Kenny is not the right man for the job, but it does mean something's not quite right at the moment. Kenny may claim we were unlucky at Hampden Park, but we seem to be perpetually claiming misfortune. No team is unlucky all the time. There is a League of Ireland manager loses in Europe ring to such a protestation. Uh, he says there were things to admire in the latest loss. He uh, cites the back three, says they're brilliant. Says of the power chance, you can argue everything would have been different had Ireland converted the golden opportunity which came their way in 57 minutes. And he says in that moment you can see why, despite Parrott's gifts, he has found goals more difficult to come by than anyone would have predicted when he first burst on the scene. And then uh, final uh, point, he says, this Nations League has been a sobering wake-up call. Scotland are a team with similar resources to our own and they seem more competitively hardened. Ireland are a side still being damned with the faint praise of encouraging signs for the future, etc. And uh, he goes on to say, um, even if we score six goals against Armenia Tuesday, it won't change the fact that we didn't get the results in the games that mattered. It's a big worry going forward. This is the same Scotland team that Ireland beat 3-0 the last time they met, yeah? Mm. Mm. And they're light years ahead of us. I don't think so. Do they've got think better players. In, in they've June? got access to better players, no doubt. <clears throat> they've got players like McTominay and Tierney who play with Man United and Arsenal. And the reality is the Republic of Ireland have probably never had a fewer number of top flight players. Mm. And I was reading Neil O'Reardon in The um, Sun. The Sun, And he yeah. was making the point that seven of this team were 23 or under. Yeah, starting 11, yeah. You know, seven, seven of them 23. And I agree with Vinny... I want this team to succeed because I enjoy watching them. And I wouldn't always have said that about Republic of Ireland teams in the past. And he was also making the point, Neil, that you know there was no place for Shane Duffy. But the three defenders he picked are much more comfortable playing the ball out from the back than Duffy is. And so it would, and it's good to watch them play, trying to play football. But there is undoubtedly a divided opinion out there, Vinny. There's a lot of people who support our football who travel over to England every weekend. I would, you know, are very question of a League of Ireland man, quote-unquote, managing the team. And then there's also a huge bailiwick of people within Ireland who would love to see him succeed because he is an Irishman and a League of Ireland manager. I think there is a split among yeah. soccer writers and it's, it's almost a generational sp split among soccer writers. That the more senior writers, the, the more long-serving soccer writers believe he's been judged more gently than previous Irish managers. And I think they're probably right. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that, you know, their argument that three wins in 20 would not be sustainable under Mick McCarthy, would not be sustainable under Martin O'Neill, is actually valid. Mm -hmm. S Stephen Kenny himself said at the start of this group that the intention was to top the group. And I don't think topping the group was an unrealistic ambition. You know, when you think of what happened in Yerevan in the first game, and suddenly the rug is pulled from under you. And, you know, last night wasn't a shock. I mean, I think we're pretty even with Scotland. Mm -hmm. they, have a, they have more depth to their squad, but in terms of pure ability... I think we're, we're on a par with them. As Jerry says, we beat them 3-0 in Lansdowne. And last night we were 
comfortably the better team in the first half. But you've got to start nailing results. And I don't know psychologically if that comes eventually with a team that's experiencing something like last night. So whatever happens on Tuesday night against Armenia, this is another opportunity gone. And I think Stephen Kenny himself knows that this is an underperformance in terms of results. Mm. Yes, people, particularly, I think, people who have been going to Lansdowne for years and watching kind of an industrial quantity of quality of football, which one of the things that it entertained me actually was a headline in the mail. Um, <laughs> Agricultural and limited muscle man. Yes, <laughs> uh, the Scottish view, which seemed to me someone who had come up with that line before he even mm, sat down yeah. to watch the match, mm. because that's the one thing this Irish team is not. They're not agricultural. They are actually a very, you used the word nuanced, I, I think they've, they've a, a nuanced style of play. I love the aggression of their counter-attack. They counter at, at speed and with, with intent. Mm. Like so many times, I've, I'm 42 years in this business, Joe, and the number of soccer internationals I've gone to where I'm trying to write a colour piece in a very short timeline and there's literally nothing to write about because what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up to be hard to score against. And it's that kind of championship level ambition that we've adhered to for so many years. And, you know, we, we, we saw Brian Kerr was the... the, 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 the the darling of the soccer writers when he got the job. I always remember that day in the Shelburne and there was such a, an outpouring of joy when he got the job and two years later people had turned on him and they turned on him, on him essentially because his only background was League of Ireland and underage football. And the view was, well, he doesn't have the aura or the authority in a dressing room to command respect from full-time professionals because he's never done it himself. And you can see that that narrative is kind of creeping in slightly into the Kenny thing, even though we see them playing good football, even though we see these players clearly want to play for him and clearly are responding to what he's saying, that narrative is there in the background, League of Ireland. A little bit of Scottish experience as well, but League of Ireland, does he know how to do this? But I'll ask you one question. What's the alternative? Mm. If, if, if we decide to jettison Stephen Kenny, where are we going? Mm-hmm. Big, Chris big, big Sam? Big Sam, big, you know. I've seen this in WhatsApp groups. Big Sam. If Big Sam took over Republic of Ireland and they were playing in the back garden, I wouldn't open the curtains. Yeah. To I be, mean, just to follow up as well on that, I wonder if, in some respects, Brian got unfairly treated. Yeah. He'd be shunted out after two years. He should have been given another term. And you're right, the League of Ireland background, underage football, contributed to that. And, of course, as did Delaney's relationship with Steve Staunton, and look where Steve Staunton got us, you know. 5-2 mm. defeat by Cyprus and we were lucky to get two. To be fair, when I say... Uh, and, I, I, and again, I would, I would agree totally with Vinny. Yeah. I don't want Sam out Sam of Big when Sam I said, When in. I said Big Sam, I was joking. Because actually, well, it's wrong to position this as Stephen Kenny and Ireland play football or under the next manager, Ireland won't play football. Mm-hmm. Because football has moved on. Whichever and whenever the next appointment, who that may be or when that happens, that next manager is going to try and play football as well. Football is just evolving in that direction. So we're never going to go back to, well, just boot it long and don't pass. So it is wrong to position this as Stephen Kenny and good football or we go back to the dark ages. We won't go back to the dark ages. Mm. So mm. it's you, you asked the really interesting question, Vincent, which is, you know, this team, seven under the age of 23 last night, does last night and the experience of last night allow them to win a, a similarly sticky Euro qualification campaign match in a year's time? Mm. Or will it be the same situation repeated. Yeah. We don't know the answer to that question. You know, there's a cliche in, in sport that we use all the time in our game, and it's, you know, when a team is beaten, a lot of learning. Yes. So learning yes. from your mistakes. Well, sometimes you're beaten because you're not good enough when it comes to the actual acid test of mm. getting over the line. What's your gut with this Irish team? Learnings I, or...? I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know, Joe. Um, but I don't see a viable alternative right now. They've given Stephen Kenny the new contract. I think they've got to go with him. And I do believe these players are playing for him. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Matt Doherty will look at the first goal last night and say, I I could have been better there. Um, I think the penalty was a stonewall penalty, so Stephen shouldn't go on about that. But there's still a lot to like about them. And, and, you know, but bear in mind, Tuesday night, they don't beat Armenia. Yeah. Like a second string First Ukraine went and won 5 0 in, in Yerevan yesterday. Mm. So this could turn really sour mm-hmm. potentially if they don't put Armenia to bed 
very efficiently on Tuesday. Mm. Um, Mick Foley um, had a great line at the end of his piece. So, in effect, the angle Mick took in the Sunday Times was just to talk about that back three of John Egan and Nathan Collins and Darrow Shea and just say, you know, they've played every league game so far for their clubs. They were brilliant last night. And uh, he talks at length about them, but he concludes... Uh, that said, losing also leaves this group miles off the pace in their uh, group, still stuck in that limbo land between promise and progress. And that's an equally pressing reality. So we are somewhere between promise and progress. Yeah, that's a very fair comment. Yeah. There we go. So yeah, on to Tuesday and uh, an early goal would settle everybody right. Because if, we're st- <laughs> if the if groans are starting on the hour mark. Yeah, and if it doesn't come, you know, Does it's Stephen a pressure Kenny's game. I made the argument uh, quite a bit, even in advance of the game last night. He was saying... Like there is a real connection with this team and the public and look at Armenia Tuesday night where well over 40,000 tickets sold for a Tuesday. Are you telling me there's not something happening here and that people aren't recognising it? There is, it's palpable. You can sense it at the Aviva Stadium for football games now in a way that wasn't there a few years ago. So there is this connection with, fan, with the football fan base in, in Ireland, which is great to see, isn't it? It is, but I wouldn't over-egg it um, because I think it can be a threadbare thing. Mm. And like I said, Tuesday night, if in the 80th minute they're huffing and puffing and there's no goals coming, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's a, a sour tone coming off the terraces because, because at, at some point patience will snap. And I think, yes, there has been an energy between the, the team and the supporters in the last year because they have clearly played pretty well at times. Yeah. But at some point you do reach the, that intersection where you've got to deliver. Mm. And the minimum delivery on Tuesday is a, is a convincing win. Mm. And that's not something Irish teams have historically tended to do. Exactly. Even under Jack Charlton, exactly. even the best Irish teams didn't tend to put opposition, weaker opposition teams to the sword. And this team doesn't look particularly equipped to score a hat load of goals either, no we matter a, how well they We played. got a glimpse against Qatar last year where they played brilliant football mm. in those blue jerseys mm. and cut them to shreds. So mm. that as opposed to what we saw in Yerevan, would be uh, yes. very welcome. Just, um, what have we got here? Five minutes before I just take a break for news. Uh, Mark Lawrenson's on the front page. I mentioned it of the uh, Sunday Times. So it's a chat with Paul Rowan inside and uh, he describes where he was sacked by BBC in effect. Uh, Can you come into the office for a coffee, Lauro? The BBC head of football said and Lawrenson said, just tell me over the phone. I'm not going to, I don't want to drive 50 miles to Manchester to tell me over a cup of coffee. I'm not working next year. And so he's, He's duly um, been let go and he says uh, the B were probably the worst at giving you the bad news. So he's asked, what do you think the real reason for your departure was? And in that, you know, Lawrence and fashion of the, the, the rise line, he says, well, I'm 65 and a white male. So, you know, dot, 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 dot. And um, the piece mentions the likes of Mark Pugac and uh, Cornelius Lysett and Alan Green being shown the door well before they considered their time was done. And uh, Lawrenson talks about how sad he was when Dan Walker left Football Focus, thought he was the best presenter. And he subsequently worked with Alex Scott. He says, Alex was just thrown in. So from the outset, we were trying to make the program as easy as possible. It was a little bit frustrating. She would ask a question and then move on to the next person. And I would want to say something I just thought of, but I had to shut up because she was learning. She's done well in fairness to her and she's a lovely kid. It's a tough gig because Dan was so good. Some people just don't want her to be any good, but she's gotten better and better. And uh, he uh, acknowledges he's a Marmite figure and he reflects on um, his time at the BBC, says he enjoyed it in the main. And I mean, there's a unbelievable anecdote about 1997 yes. where he, um, if there was a game a couple of days after Diana had died. And he said, the editor of the programme came over and said, any free kicks around the penalty area tonight, please don't mention the wall. I don't remember who was commentating with that night, but I asked him, is that for real? And he said, oh yeah, that is for real. So uh, there was really no mentions of, of walls after uh, Diana had died in those immediate few days. So um, that's Lawrence and it's made the front page. I suspect there'll be uh, plenty of fallout. I mean, there's the headline on the Sunday Times. BBC asked me for being 65 and white is his take on things. I yeah. think there may be a legitimacy to that. We saw Sky Sports get rid of Matt Letizia, Phil Thompson, Charlie Nicholas. Um, for no clear reason. I, and, I, and I do feel when I listen to some of the criticism, for example, of the Sunday game in recent years of Pat Spillane and Colin Morocco, who both left the programme now, obviously, but it's in a very ageist tone and it's delivered in a way that suggests old guys complaining. Mm. And I've heard that expression, old guys complaining. And I do think there is an ageist 
dimension to what's going on here. But even then you look at Laura's language when he says she's a good kid and, and it's it's almost a patronising... She's in her late 30s. Yeah, there's almost a patronising tone to it. So, mm-hmm. you know, he's not helping himself when he comes out and says something like that. But look, I watch so much of broadcasting now and it seems the most important thing that presenters are told is we must be likeable and we must smile. And sometimes I watch... I watch TV presentation and it's almost like the presenters are slightly medicated. They're they're just so keen to be liked rather than have some kind of rigorous journalism to what they're doing. Mm. And um, so I, I see a legitimacy in what he's saying, um, but I also see a kind of slightly patronising tone with yes. you know, what I, he says. I, I, I've, I know Laura quite well from way back when. I used to ghost his column in the Irish Times and he's, he's a really nice bloke and I like him a lot and I remember watching that last football focus when he was leaving and I was why are they getting rid of him I think he's still quite good and he can be very he can be very funny you know and uh, he's different <laughs> yes but I agree with Vinny there is an ages thing to it now whereby it's why Johnny Giles was partly removed from the RTE I'm sure as well mm-hmm. um, and it also made me think of like Graeme Souness was treading on very thin water as well. We talked about this was a man's game and Karen Carney's a fellow guest with them and mm. it wasn't a particularly woke thing to say at all either. And there, it's, it's, it's just a changing environment for um, broadcasting sports where you see people like Lawrence are gone. I, I think it's a shame myself, but it's definitely part of a trend. Yeah. And uh, it's a disappointing trend in some respects. And I don't know, I, 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 would, still, I would still listen to Giles in news talk and I still think he's got a lot to offer. I wasn't so sure that RT should have got rid of him. Well, experience is a lot tougher. Like even yeah. on the rugby, I, Matt Williams and his grasp of um, how rugby's evolved. I mean, I'll, I'll still watch a game with Matt, and there'll be a move that Ireland will do or Leinster will do, and he said, "Ah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that one's from uh, Aussie mm-hmm. yeah. and '82. Remember that one? We called yeah. it rock stars. They call it something else." And you're mm-hmm. like, "All oh, right, so you get a, yeah. you know yeah. that experience yeah. is important as well. Exactly. Otherwise, it can get a bit too samey, can't it? Sure. And yet, you still need to infuse broadcasting with. New faces. Yeah, there has yeah. to be yep. representation. It's important because I mean, otherwise, if it's just uh, well, look at us. You know, you can't. It can't <laughs> yeah. just be uh, yeah. us lot giving our view on the world either. And but there it's is, been there is, there for is a long time. There is an element of making everything quite bland. I think, Joe. Yeah. Well, I'll, you know, I'll come to that because actually, Neil Francis has a, a piece, and I certainly won't take offence to it because he says um, the broadcasting around rugby has gone to the dogs. Is his opinion. So we might chat about what we want from um, a broadcasting panel in just a moment. But I do have to break off for uh, news. We're reviewing the Sunday papers. We have Vincent Hogan and Jerry Thornley with us. We're back in just one second after news headlines. The Sunday papers on Off the Ball. We're on Twitter. Just look for at News Talk FM for the latest updates. At Volkswagen Commercial Vehicles, the wait is over. Production is back. Now your plans can begin. Scale your business, smarten your service offering with HP Finance from 3.9%, purchase contributions of up to €3,000 and service plans from 12 99 per month. Don't wait. Secure your next Caddy Cargo, Transporter 6.1 or Crafter at your local Volkswagen Commercial Vehicles dealer. Be ready to really deliver. Offers for business customers only. Finance provided by way of higher purchase agreement from Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland. Subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland Limited is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Visit volkswagenvans.ie for further information. Get away from it all this autumn with Go Brakes and get an extra €5 Euro off when you book by October 3rd. Only at gobrakes.ie. Go Brakes. Bonnichen Olskal Breshes Kid Shachtu Kud Blenochen. Our journey has seen us inspire world-class engineers, drive passion for the arts, and pioneer breakthroughs in medicine. This is the place to drive cutting-edge research. This is the place to learn and the space to grow. We are Ulskal Nagalive, University of Galway, the arts and Manitou Bar the Wahasa Amal. Your space and place to thrive. Discover more at universityofgalway.ie. We've squeezed two great offers into one great sale. Switch to Virgin Media now and enjoy 500 meg speeds as standard. That's ultra-fast and reliable broadband for just €40 Euro a month for 12 months. Want to add great TV? Then get TV360 for an extra €15 Euro a month. Switch in-store or at virginmedia.ie. Virgin Media. Bring on amazing. Subject to location and availability, new customers only. 12-month contract, 500 meg broadband, €70 a month after offer. 
Broadband and TV, €55 euro a month for 12 months. €99 euro thereafter. Ends October 5th, 2022. T's and C's apply. See virginmedia.ie. At Zurich, we don't insure against. We insure for. For ditching work and heading for the hills. For I spy and sing-alongs. For country meanders and refreshing woodland walks. For the crunch of the driveway and the porch lights glow. For priceless memories and new adventures. Zurich. For car insurance. For what can go right. Visit Zurich.ie. Zurich Insurance PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Imagine a better way to manage your energy with a smart plan from Board Gosh Energy. Our smart plans, like Free Time Saturday or Free Time Sunday, can help you lower your bills and reduce your energy usage. Find a smart plan that works for you and your home at boardgoshenergy.ie slash smart. Free energy units are available from 9am to 5pm on Saturday or Sunday each week with this tariff. Customers can choose Saturday or Sunday. Smart meter required. Terms and conditions apply. See boardgoshenergy.ie. This is the Advantage card from OnPost Commerce. This saves your business three euro on every parcel you send. This is a way to help your business grow and thrive by cutting your costs and boosting your revenue. This is e-commerce for everyone. Get your Advantage card free at OnPost.com today or at your local post office. OnPost Commerce, a world closer. Terms and conditions apply. On 106 to 108 FM. On the News Talk app, powered by Go Loud and Smart Speaker. This, this is News Talk. It's two o'clock at afternoon. The Irish Cancer Society says patients facing hospital bills are terrified of the rising cost of living this winter. The charity wants hospital fees for cancer treatment to be abolished in next week's budget announcement. CEO Avril Power says patients often struggle financially due to a loss of income. Most face a big drop in income because they have to stop working while they're undergoing treatment. And at the same time, they're hit by an avalanche of extra costs for everything from inpatient charges for chemotherapy and other hospital treatments. A children's charity says the government needs to take action to ensure school uniforms are affordable for all. Bernardo says all schools should be forced to make low-cost uniforms available. The organisation is also calling for a universal scheme for free school books to be included in the budget. Elsewhere, Gardaí and Galway City are marching from the train station to the top of Air Square today. It's part of 100-year commemorations of the first Gardaí arriving into Galway. Current and retired members of Angarda Síochána will take place in the events. And it's expected Italy will elect a far-right Prime Minister in its general election later. Giorgia Maloney, who leads the Brothers of Italy party, could become the country's first female head of government. That's it for now. All news updates are on our website. That's newstalk.com. News talk weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Leave the kids at home this midterm and book a sneaky getaway with Ryanair low fare flights to over 200 destinations. Cloudy and blustery for the most part this afternoon. Rain will extend into Ulster and Connacht later this evening with highs of 14 to 16 degrees. Now you're up to date on News Talk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Now then, you're welcome back. So we're reviewing the Sunday papers in the company of Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times and Vincent Hogan of the Irish Independent. We were just chatting there about Mark Lawrenson, who uh, wasn't thrilled with the uh, reasons, well, the reasons he thinks the BBC uh, let him go for being 65 and white. And we were chatting about TV panels generally. And Neil Francis in the Sunday Times, uh, just by coincidence, is talking about punditry. So the byline is, uh, our punditry is dire. And they're in another league over the pond. Over the pond, he means... U.S. sports in particular. Uh, he talks about the brilliant Tony Romo. So he is uh, saying of uh, colour commentators, be that in on the panel or calling a game, rule number one, have an opinion. Rule number two, be able to articulate that opinion. You should also act as though you want to be there. He says there's been a slow, inexorable decline in television rugby commentary discussion over the last few years. Incremental and barely perceptible, but most assuredly going downhill. Uh, last year I started reviewing matches with the sound off. If punters do the same, the game is gone. And he says Eddie Butler's premature passing could be the signal to open the gates as producers uh, settle for middle of the road and he puts in uh, quotation marks talent. He says the low point in recent history was the Lions Tour of South Africa in 2021. He said maybe the quality of rugby brought everything down but that series put people off watching big time rugby. The coverage went down the tubes along with the rugby. 
Uh, he mentioned Argentina, Australia recently, 20 minutes of the worst match commentary ever. And he cites something like the breakdown with John Kirwan and Jeff Wilson as uh, a rare example of something which is uh, good. If I was on board in CVC and I saw the dull meat and two veg commentary in some of the competitions I put large amounts of money into, I'd be in a bigger hurry to ramp up the entertainment levels off the pitch. The Yanks have it right because they spend the money. And he said, certainly misses Ron Agar off the coverage. He says, uh, if you offer me the chance to watch three Ogaras argue, <laughs> it's quite the image. Uh, he said, you wouldn't even bother watching the rugby instead of that. And But his point is actually, it goes about different competitions, different coverage. He says, it impinges on the quality of the occasion if you watch it on TV. I mean, the, I would definitely agree that the TV coverage is absolutely of fundamental importance as, as part of the overall offering. So, um, an inexorable decline, Jerry. No, I wouldn't go that far because I think in many ways rugby coverage and analysis on television now is incomparable to 10 or 20 years ago when you, you know, like, let's leave out Virgin, let's go to RT and think about Bernard Jackman and Murray Kinsley and the analysis they will do before, during and after a game. I think it's very strong. Yeah. And I, I learn more than I would have from a TV commentary team now than I would have if, uh, many years ago. But I do agree with an awful lot of the sentiments. Eddie Butler, I would always, I would always re-watch a game if Eddie Butler was, the com- was doing the commentary. I really, hmm. I'm really saddened by Eddie's passing. He was a great bloke, as much as anything else, and a, a great, great comrade to all of us in the press box. Just a lovely human being, very generous, very you know, multilingual, very intelligent. And his, his, no doubt his commentaries were different because he wasn't particularly programmed, he wasn't particularly well coached. He just came into it and just did it in his own lyrical, idiosyncratic way. Mm. And in tandem with Brian Moore, it was compelling listening. Um, I agree with Fran as well. I cannot abide Australian commentaries in the rugby championship. I nearly do turn the volume down. The Australian commentary teams are just so one-eyed. Ah, oh, try time for the Wallabies. It's just unbearable. And it's like the penalty count should be about 25-2 to Australia at the end of every game if you actually go through the tape. Mm. Um, and how could you not disagree about Rod? He's brilliant. You know, we all know he's brilliant. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, it'll be interesting what the BBC do now. Butler's passing is a huge loss to the game in so many ways. It really is. Yeah. I guess it depends what you're after as well in some yeah. respects. Like when BT do uh, games with their A team and you have two co-commentators and mid-game, one of them will go off and do a piece of analysis and then at a break and play it will be slotted in and they'll show you what lines yes. drawn on the screen yeah. how X and Y happened. Yeah. I am kind of watching that saying, well, That's good. that just by definition is better than yeah. 20, 30 years ago. Unless it's hard opinions. I, I think... Frano uses an expression in that piece, entertainment value. Yeah. You've got to be very, very careful that, that you're not over-focusing on entertainment value and almost insulting the viewer's intelligence mm-hmm. because I think you go down the road of it being performative then and rather than serious analysis. And as someone who's, who's not that big into the rugby, I love listening to Eddie O'Sullivan. I'd be biased. I did Eddie's book. I think he's really analytical and, and mm-hmm. tactical and technical. Bernard Jackman, the same. I think the quality of analysis in rugby is way superior to what, than what we get in the GA generally really? or, or in soccer. Yes, really? I do, because I find rugby a very complex game. Yes, true. And, and I've always said I, I've never understood how journalists in the press box can give me, immediately after a match, exactly what's happened in that front row because I haven't a rashers and I've I've gone and covered rugby for 42 years and I have never had a rashers what's going on in the front row and I'll, 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 say, I'll bring that to my grave so I am always interested in a pundit telling me something I don't know explaining something to me that I cannot see and in, in the case of rugby there's plenty of that that I, I can't see with my naked eye and I think we're very well served with rugby pundits because they explain it to you in a, in a way that's understandable to some Joe Bloggs like me. Mm. Also, the use of modern technology is so much improved. You think back 10, 15, 20 years ago, you would just have three people talking for half an hour after the game in the studio, mm. almost with no, just would yeah, maybe but, just run, rerun in the occasional but, try, but, but no did, real uh, other uh, in-depth Yeah, I take coverage. that point, but maybe did the average punter enjoy the rows that would happen then and the free-flowing talk that would happen? I, th- I think there was an element of that, and, and, was, and yeah. I, I think certainly when Tom McGurk had George Hook and, and Brent Pope, enough, yeah. it, it was like almost a soap opera, and, yeah. it, and it was entertainment, mm-hmm. but whether it was real in terms of the analysis, I mean, some of it was just blatantly trying to get a reaction, in my view, mm-hmm. And I also felt it, it fed the egos of the guys in question because I remember reading an interview with Tom McGurk after they, they broke up like as if they were the Beatles breaking up and the sense of self that those guys had by the end was extraordinary mm-hmm. because their job was to 
explain rugby to us. And I, I do remember one time I was on holidays in the Canaries and watching an Ireland-France game in Paris. And it was one of those games where the French just went at us from the, the get-go. And I think they got four first-half tries. And every time the, the scrum half got the ball, he just ran it and they just picked holes in us. And George Hook, um, in his analysis at halftime, said something along the lines of, well, the game was lost in the first scrum. And I'm kind of thinking, sorry? But as, as they broke for the ads then, a guy with a pint and a, a guy with his mate, they drink of pints in front of me, and one turns to the other and says, sure, the game was lost in the first scrum. So the influence those, those people have mm. is enormous. But to me, George, George Hook had just uttered pure nonsense that day. It, it made no sense to me in an, an, analysing a game where we'd been run off the park that he was talking about scrums. Mm. But it, the people were listening. Yeah. I'm conscious he's not here to defend himself. Maybe he saw it that way and he's entitled to his opinion and I'm sure he was given good, honest opinion. Sure. That said, I thought that panel, when they were really motoring and all debating each other, I thought it was brilliant. Mm-hmm. It was entertaining. It was it's must watch. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, we can probably, as we head towards, well, got to be analytical, do we forget entertainment a bit, you know? Yeah, how do we strike the balance, you know? It's and and, and I, I do think O'Gara is a compelling figure on television because he, he has that strength of analysis, yeah. but he's also very forceful in his opinions. He's not afraid to have a go at somebody. He's unpredictable. He's yeah, he's make also, it awkward yeah. in there if he wants to. He's also very thoughtful yeah. and honest. You yeah, ask him yeah. a question and he will pause and actually consider the question yeah. and come up with a considered answer. And I remember asking him once, why do you take it so seriously? He's because a lot of people will be watching it. They might only watch rugby four or five times a year. Mm. They might be sitting down in their homes in Cork or wherever it is, tuning into rugby for an, an international game. That I've got to give them as much information I can. They deserve that. No, he's amazing. Like, he is amazing. I think Barnsley's sure. missed from Sky Sports. Yeah, I mean, th- that, that period where Munster were going well in yes. Europe and Sky Sports had yeah. that competition and it was Barnsley on co-comp that was that worked that worked because yeah. Barnsley got us all he wasn't pro unnecessarily pro English in the same way that Eddie Butler you never s- felt he was excessively pro Welsh like Eddie was fluent French and he got French rugby you know yeah. what I mean he got all co- types of rugby he loved the old Lansdowne Road and Barnsley had a great appreciation for what Munster brought to the yes. Heineken Cup you used to love him like giving a reference to how much he loved Limerick and it was, you know yeah. 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 <laughs> maybe yeah. it was a touch political but geez it got me yeah and you also knew he enjoyed the wine whenever he went over to yeah. France but where I think we all agree with Neil Francis like if the TV coverage is good it just elevates the whole mm. experience you know and there is nothing more disappointing than if you tune in I'm not going to name any individuals or stations or even sports but you tune in and you see a certain panel or you see a certain and you think it oh, adds to it or it doesn't or it doesn't you're yeah. like yeah. you know mm. so like it's probably easy uh, easily taken for granted by um, powers that be that well it doesn't matter but it really does matter we spend more time talking about what Roy Keane and Gary Neville said on a Monday than what happened on a Sunday you know so I don't know uh, your thoughts to 53106 I'd be um, be interested just to, did you guys get a chance to read this Joe Brawley David Goff interview yes I did I mean it's like if you want so this is in the I could have easily missed this this is in the main section of the Sunday Independent if you want from an interview two people having a really intimate conversation and your eavesdropping this is the interview so David Goff high profile GEA referee and um, well they have drinks uh, three years ago it starts off David Goff uh, sent off Dublin's Johnny Cooper in the Ireland final I had something to say about his decision said Joe Brawley it marked uh, the beginning of the end for me at RTE Brawley starts off the interview by saying you never apologised for getting me sacked and uh, it kind of goes from there and so uh, David Goff tells this um story he says I've never spoken publicly about this I'm 14 years old I'm walking home from school I pass a news agent and I see the front page of the star it's a story about Stephen Gately coming out he was wearing a kilt in the pick it was like a bomb going off inside me suddenly I knew Brawley you were excited David says this is tough I've never told anyone this Brawley says well we stop no 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 keep going I want to tell you this I was terrified it was scary I went inside I bought the newspaper I hid it in a button folder in my bag. I'd never brought, bought a paper before. I went home as fast as I could, went up to my bedroom, I locked the door, I sat in the bed, I took the paper out and I read it and I read it again and again and again. I couldn't believe there was someone else who felt like me. And Brawley says, this was the moment you confronted the fact you were gay. David says, no, no, no. The fact that this superstar known all over the world had come out rocked me. And uh, he talks about the difficulties he had. So he said, uh, so long as I never uttered the words, I'm gay, then it wasn't real. I decided I would never never breathe life to the fire that was inside me. And that way, nobody would ever know. And uh, he talks about how he went out with girls. You did? I did. 
I mentioned uh, a gay friend of mine who told me married men are constantly badgering him for sex. Actually, I'm conscious we're on the uh, radio, so if you've got kids in the car, it's belated. <laughs> if you've kids in the car, uh, there's, uh, it's not overly graphic, but you might just turn off if you want for uh, a minute. And then, hey, listen, if there's kids of a certain age, then it's probably an, in- an interview they should, uh, they should hear. Uh, tell me about it, says uh, Goff, in reply to that sense of married men who are badgering um, a single gay men for sex. Tell me about it, he says. Um, so, they, they, I mean, they talk about his love life and it's very open and, you know, uh, his first girlfriend, did you kiss her? Yes, sex, no. And then at university, it's girls but only kissing. David says, God, no, by then I was having sex with girls. No way, how many? David says, plenty. How does that work? So again, this is what I mean about this is an intimate conversation. How does that work? David says, strictly mechanical. I was saying to myself, it's not so bad. I can do this. I can get away with it. That line is just so awful, isn't it? So sad. And Broly says, like all those married men with children meeting in public loos, leading lives of quiet despair. Exactly, says David. It could have been you. Yes, says David. And uh, he talks eventually about coming out the um, poem Blessings by John O'Donoghue for the time of necessary decision. It's called um, Prompted Tears. And he talks about reading that poem and how he felt so upset. It's about, you know, living with a weight and deciding I can't live with it anymore. I have to to come clean or make a decision. So uh, he says of reading that poem and then the context was I'd just broken up with a girlfriend at that time. Bradley says, Jesus. David says, I know. It was at the Leinster referees banquet. And then Bradley says, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. It's like a scene from Alan Partridge. (laughs) (laughs) It's a hell of a place to break up with someone. (laughs) So he says, of telling his family, he drove back to his parents in Slane that night. He couldn't bring himself to tell them. On the Sunday at six, he finally uh, asked them and his brother Stephen to come to the kitchen. Like a great con man, he had hidden himself in plain sight for 24 years. The football, the women, the weekly mass, it would all come down to this moment. All I could say, says David, was, look, I have a partner, his name is Dave. How did that feel, asked Bradley? An eruption of first relief and then dread. Afterwards, my mother told me she was afraid I was going to tell her I'd gotten my girlfriend pregnant. How did they react? Neither of them spoke. My mother cried. My father was silent. I had said it. It filled the room between us and over us. It couldn't be unsaid. I left, I got in the car, I drove back to Dublin. A week later, my mother rang me, told me my father was getting up every morning, standing in the window, crying. Two months later, his parents rang him on speakerphone and told him they loved him and they were delighted for him. David says, now I could begin to live. And um, it's amazing. He says he still has the Stephen Gately Irish star front page. Mm. And he says, um, I've kept nothing from my childhood. I've kept that. And, you know, it's very sad. I think of him storing that newspaper carefully away as though it were an enchantment and, and is what Bradley says. And, and Goff says, it was a very lonely journey. When you're wearing a mask all the time, you're always afraid the mask will slip. It was very hard, very hard. I missed out on so much by hiding. What a terrible waste. And Bradley says, well, you'll be Stephen Gately for a lot of young people. I read that and I was like, wow. What a, it's, what a conversation. It's, it's a, heart, a heartbreaking read. Mm. Um, a heartbreaking read in the sense of <coughs> what so many boys and girls in this country went through. And, and that image of his father getting up every morning and crying in the window as if not being... I, I, I presume it was a guilt thing with the father that, I, you know, he he hadn't been able to have this conversation with his dad and it's it's just extraordinary that we were so closed for so long in this country to to a story like this but there's a line in it that i absolutely love and it's from 2017 and he says i had refed a game and was meeting a friend afterwards in panty bar to unwind now that's that's a line that really jumps out at you as this is arguably Gaelic football's best referee and he's unwinding in panty bar and he says no one tortures you about football in there and I laughed out loud when I read that I thought brilliant it's Mm. absolutely brilliant and do you know what I'm not a huge fan of Joe sometimes who can be very smart ass and can be you know slightly nasty but he handles this brilliantly because there's laughter in it so it's heartbreaking and yet there's laugh out loud lines in it like the Alan Partridge line you read out there and it's wonderful that we're here now, that David Goff can do this interview and that Don Cusa could do his book a few years ago. But it's shocking that for so long, the, the, the expression is in there, living in quiet despair. Like, how horrible 
was it that so many people in this country, not not just this country, but in this country, and the the weight that the Catholic Church put on everything for so long, and that they they just lived this private hell, mm. private hell. I, I think it's a beautiful piece. I, I, you know, as I say, it mixes heartbreak with laughter, and it's 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 lovely. It's it's handled beautifully. I um I don't know what age I would have been when Stephen Gately came out as gay but I remember it being seismic and whatever I was young enough and I quite liked boys on thought they were you know um, and I, I vividly remember late night phone in radio show and again I'm, I'm thinking back like it was such a formative time in my life and if I, you know if I was in David Goff's position what it would have done to me but like the discussion was on the back of Stephen Gately parents if your son said he was gay would you disown him like that that was the prem that was like the the jumping off point and I do remember a lot of parents ringing up saying oh no I, I would still love my son as if like they'd I done know, something exactly. terrible but, but that is not that long ago and there was also this kind of narrative well could we cure him like could we cure them like you know it's, you, you think that's not that long ago Joe and still some parts of America now where that's uh, the Very business so. is thriving more yeah. than ever your, your thoughts on this Jerry I know you didn't get a chance to read it but you've got a sense of it now oh yeah powerful piece and um it just shows you the importance of people in the entertainment industry and the sports industry if they are brave enough, for want of a better word, but it is regarded as brave. Yeah. You think of that footballer who recently came out as he one of the first footballers in England to actually admit to being gay mm. and how invaluable that must be for young sports people when they see that example. They know, OK, I'm, it makes it much easier, I'm sure, for them to live with themselves when there are examples like that. So... They're very important. And then I'd also thought to myself, um, football's going to Qatar at the end of the year where same-sex relationships aren't allowed. Mm. And, you know, the various captains of eight teams are going to wear these bands on their arms um, in support of the lesbian and gay and bisexual community. But what impact will that really have? And in the midst of all this, football is giving its biggest tournament every four years to a country where it's forbidden to have same-sex relationships. What a contradiction that is. Yeah, and I was just thinking about this, you know, in a couple of months' time, we will be so wrapped up in the football that that whole debate will be over mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll be watching the group matches and it'll be all about Gareth Southgate, his latest <coughs> crisis with England, you know, can Wales do anything? And that whole debate will be done and dusted. And, and it's like everything, even in the news cycle, you know, nobody talks about Afghanistan now because it's Ukraine. And in time, something else will happen and we'll move on from Ukraine and God knows what will continue to happen in, 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 in that war. Um, there's a kind of an attention span that we have for these things and the whole debate about Qatar has kind of exhausted itself at this stage. Yeah. Yes, it's absurd. It's utterly absurd that the World Cup is on there in, starting in November. But once it starts, we'll be gripped by the football. I know. I'm even conscious of that attention span now, but I did see Nick Harris's piece, page 7071, The yeah. Mail on Sunday. To be fair to The Mail on Sunday, they have gone after Qatar and mm. the ills there routinely and they do it again today. I, I mean, it's just a brief synopsis and um, it starts off, for instance, by mentioning a 27-year-old scaffolder from Nepal working on a World Cup stadium. So he uh, died of cardiorespiratory failure due to uh, natural cause and it turned out the accommodation he was staying in was not cleared as fit for human habitation and they reached out to the widow, the uh, Supreme Committee, which is delivering the World Cup, and they reached out to his widow and they said, look, your husband wasn't entitled to any, you're not entitled to any compensation because he was here less than a year, but listen, we've talked to the people that can be, and just as a good faith payment, here's 1,500 quid. And that's how they're treating people. And, you know, to make a long story short, Nick Harris tries to ascertain how many people have died working in these stadiums and it's just so difficult because for instance of the 2,820 or 23 deaths of foreigners of working age in Qatar which have gone unexplained or unclassified uh, since 2011 that, that, that makes it very difficult to know why they died but a lot of them were working in the World Cup uh, stadiums and a lot of them are of a uh, young age and um, you know in terms of how Qatar tied up the deaths like there were six security guards, including three Kenyans, who died uh, in a minibus because, um, well, I'm not quite sure how they died, but maybe it was on duty around the stadiums. But their deaths aren't counted because they, they didn't die in the stadium. In effect, for, for your death to be counted as 
World Cup related. You had to be in the stadium. So this this scaffolder who died in, you know, a place not fit for human habitation, he's not considered a death related to the stadium because he wasn't in the stadium. That's why they have a number of like three or four. And just one of the chilling lines is that uh, the Supreme Committee has counted none, that's N-O-N-E, none of the 551 suicides of foreigners working in Qatar since 2011 as World Cup related. So um, he says one might expect nine foreign suicides per year in Qatar for each Qatari national suicide because of population imbalance. But for every Qatari suicide, there are 79 foreign suicides and they have um, a widow of one uh, victim of suicide. And she says he was sick and tired of it all. Every month there were problems with paychecks. He also complained about the long working hours, more than 12 hours. He leaves behind daughter age six and 12. On it goes. It's, it's, it's just... It's a messy, jumbled picture. We can't get any exact figures. All these deaths are just vaguely characterised as, you know, natural causes. It's like 2022. It's disgraceful. It's absolutely scandalous. I, I've been following this story a lot in The Guardian. They've been sending out reporters yeah, there. Good. They were there last week as well. A guy called Peterson, I think his name was. He wrote some absolutely brilliant stuff. I read it every single day, interviewed workers. And, like, The Guardian estimates that the total number of World Cup-related deaths in Qatar is something in the realm of 5,500. Yeah. Um, they're paid slave labour, not even slave labour, lower than slave labour, a pound a day. Mm. A lot of them borrowed money to go out there on the premise that they were going to make, this is gonna, they were going to work for, in Qatar for a couple of years and this is going to feed their families for some time to come. And they're now being sent home without having also, covered the costs of what they borrowed. The official figures seem to apply only to stadiums in terms of World Cup. Oh, they goes to infrastructure. Yeah. Infrastructure all over um, is, is part of this. But you look at the causes of death, respiratory failure, heart attack. You're talking about 31-year-olds, 32-year-olds. Yeah. Now, that's, not, no, that's not normal. They're, that, they're know, living they're, in three, they're, three in a bed in they're, shacks. They're, there is the an elephant in the room city. when you read stuff like that. A, that age profile, dialing respiratory failure and heart attacks. It's absolutely shocking. And yet the, the wheels just keep turning. Mm. And their living conditions are beyond shocking. Um, he interviewed some of them and they, he went to one of the sites, this Guardian reporter last week, and they're like three to a bed with maybe a tent in between them. All their belongings are just underneath the bed. Mm. One communal toilet. It's just... And then they're commuted to and from the stadiums. I, I kind of... You have to be realistic about life as well. So there are, there are just a, a cultural legacy issues in Qatar. Their attitudes to same-sex marriage, their attitudes to foreign workers, which I can kind of say, well, look we evolve at different paces and, you know, homosexuality here was illegal not so long ago. So you kind of, you, you take that as just, that's life and that, that is where Qatar is at the moment. But for FIFA to not pitch up and say, we have billions. Mm. If this is happening, it's happening right. We're building good habitation. We're insisting on certain working hours. But FIFA for about a decade have just said, I don't know, what can we do? But you look at the story, and I, I read that story in the mail, of um, why did uh, Platini push for this? Because Platini voted for Qatar. And the, the mail says Nicolas Sarkozy told him to vote for Qatar because uh, Qatar were buying Airbuses from France. Mm. And mm. So, so all of this is interlinked to big business. Of and, course. And that's, that story is as old as time itself. Mm. Um, Are you going to Qatar? No, no, I'm not. I'm debating not watching it at all for the first time in my life. I really am, because mm. of all of this. And also because Ireland aren't there, and my go-to second team, Italy, aren't there either. Mm. So, but it's just, it's reprehensible. It's hard not to turn it on and look at the stadiums and not feel a sense of complicity if you're watching and cheering absolutely. on. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you know, J Jerry, what Jerry says there is, I, I, I'd love to think I could do that. I'd love to think I'd have the strength of my convictions to say I'm not watching, but I know I'll watch it. Yeah, probably I, I, too, ju yeah. I just, I will want to see the World Cup. Um, despite the fact it's so bloodstained and tarnished and outrageous where it's been held mm. um, and the time of year it's been held and, yep. and the disruption that's causing everywhere. Um, but that's a... That's a, that's a minor that's incidental... A, that's a petty this. argument compared yeah. to what we've just been talking about. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a very short break and then we'll round off the uh, final few papers and the stories. Back in one sec. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. 
Alive and Kicking with Claire McKenna. This week on the Alive and Kicking podcast, Kiri Farm is a proposed mental health recovery centre which will build a community on the farm site, allowing people to heal and integrate into society away from a clinical setting. People are absolutely crying out for something like this. Like the amount of support, goodwill, all saying, we need this. Alive and Kicking. Catch the Alive and Kicking podcast at Newstalk.com or on the Newstalk app powered by Go Loud. Our wide range of 2023 Skodas are going fast. This is the sound of Anto driving home in his sporty Octavia RS. And this is fully charged Fiona driving away in her electric Skoda Enyaq. And this is the sound of someone who didn't place their order in time. Ah, for Order your 2023 Skoda today before it's too late. Skoda. Made for Ireland. Some people spend 60 minutes watching TV and some head out for a 10K run. Just like retirement, 60 minutes means different things to different people. At Bank of Ireland, we're all about your financial well-being and 60 minutes is all it takes to start a pension that can make your retirement lifestyle achievable. Now's the time to fund your future. Book a phone or virtual meeting today at bankofireland.com forward slash pensions. Bank of Ireland. Begin. Revenue limits, terms and conditions apply. Bank of Ireland is a tied agent of New Ireland Assurance Company, PLC, trading as Bank of Ireland Life for life assurance and pensions business. Members of Bank of Ireland Group. Bank of Ireland trading as Bank of Ireland Insurance and Investments is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Hi, I'm Ken Hardy, and when I need car insurance, I contact the specialists at insuremycars.ie. Their team always finds me the best policy at the lowest price and with all the benefits I need. If your car insurance is up for renewal, visit insuremycars.ie. City Financial Marketing Group Limited trading as insuremycars.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. It's time to sparkle with Pandora. For a limited time only, buy two and get a third free on full price jewellery. Show someone special that you're thinking of them or take the chance to treat yourself. But hurry, this offer won't be around for long. In 2nd of October, available in participating stores while stocks last. Terms and exclusions apply. Get away from it all this autumn with Go Breaks and get an extra five euro off when you book by October 3rd. Only at gobreaks.ie. Go breaks. You stand for peace, and yet you fight for a clean future with energy made in Europe. You live democracy, but don't compromise when it comes to climate protection. You want a climate neutral Europe. Renewables will get us there. Day by day, more and more people are joining you on your way. You are Europe. Get our best value 5G prepay offer with Air Mobile. For just 20 euro top up, enjoy no limits 5G data, unlimited calls, and unlimited texts on Ireland's largest 5G network. Sign up to Air Prepay today and you'll keep this 20 euro offer forever. Air, let's make possible. Subject to 20 euro top up every 28 days. Offer ends October 30th. Fair usage applies. For full terms, see air.ie. Here's a notion for you. Buying trusted Irish food and drink brands doesn't mean you're losing the run of yourself. Far from it. From Falloin to Flahavins, Glenisk to McCambridge, Ballymaloo to Ballygowan and many more, you're enjoying great taste and quality while supporting Irish jobs. If you love quality local food made right here by people who care, you'll love Irish food. So look out for the Love Irish Food Hearts next time you shop. Sometimes notions are a great thing. Love Irish food. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Now you're welcome back. Uh, Joe Malloy here. Sunday Papers continuing in just a moment. Do want to check in though at Tremolan Castle where Ashley O'Reilly has the latest at the Irish Open. The crowds are out in force for Cavan's Leona Maguire at the final day of the KPMG Women's Irish Open at Tremolan Castle. There is a slight breeze making things that little bit trickier out on the course. Maguire started the day two shots off the leader with an impressive round three, scoring a best of the day 65. She teed off at 11.20am, bogey the first and second, but started to find her rhythm then and got a brilliant birdie on the seventh and tenth and she is currently three shots off the lead. It's England's Annabelle Dimmock who sits in first position 
Association, 12 under par, followed by five players, Denmark's Nicole Broach Esther, Clara Spilkova of Czech Republic, Austria's Christine Wolf, Anne Van Damme from France, and Sweden's Moa Folk, who were all just one shot behind. It's still all very much to play for here at the KPMG Women's Irish Open. That's the very latest. Ashling with us across the afternoon and our golf coverage here on Off the Ball is in association with the KPMG Women's Irish Open. Jerry Thornley and Vincent Hogan here in studio going through the Sunday papers. The Paul Pogba plot, pages six and seven of the Sunday Times. It's just insane, this whole thing. We'll give you the, the not the fully dense version because we really would be here all day. This is kind of John le Carre-esque, but... In effect, uh, Paul Pogba, it seems, has had various people over the last uh, couple of years taking money from him in various ways. Much of what we know, writes Adam Sage in Paris, comes from transcripts published by Le Monde. And its origins really are in the Renardière council estate, east of Paris, where Pogba grew up. And uh, it includes his brothers, Matthias and uh, Florentin. Their parents immigrated from Guinea. So uh, Paul Pogba was there recently and he was kidnapped and he knew the people who kidnapped him. We don't get their second names because this is all very legal at the moment, but he was kidnapped. And this was a couple of years ago now. So instead of him being driven to the uh, capital, to his hotel, as he thought, after he'd been in his uh, local estate, the three men took him to a flat where he was ordered to hand over his telephone. And that's crucial because they took information off his telephone. And they started talking to me saying I'd abandoned them. Pogba told police, as in, you know, I became big time and forgot about where I came from. Pogba said they ordered him to pay them 13 million euro for having protected him for years. And they said if he didn't, they would make public, they would make public a USB key containing emails he had sent apparently to a a mystic or a witch doctor in which Pogba had apparently wanted to curse Mbappe. Pogba said uh, to police, I was afraid. The two blokes pointed their weapons at me again, being targeted and under threat. I said I was going to pay. He tried to pay them. It didn't go through. Clearly his bank account thought 13 million quid was a big old transaction without double checking. And when that didn't go through, he changed his mind. Later that month, four men arrived in the Adidas store on the Champs-Élysées, claiming to be Pogba's friends and they had authorization to use his account. They walk out of the Adidas store with 47,000 euro worth of gear. Now Pogba in his deal with Adidas, is allowed to take a maximum of 30 grand in clothes, which is not a bad deal, by the way. But uh, So he turns up afterwards at the Champs-Élysées Adidas, apologises for the 47 grand, and he, he pays the 17 grand extra, which he's not allowed. So then in April, the two alleged uh, extortioners turned up in Pogba's flat in Manchester and they wanted money. He told police he had given €100,000 in cash to one of these people, uh, that person denies getting the cash. And then amongst the group was uh, Matthias, his brother. So they turned up subsequently at uh, his home in Juventus in Turin. Two days after that, Pogba files a criminal lawsuit in Italy. Uh, French police take up this investigation. And they took a statement from Pogba in August. Uh, the threats continued, apparently. Pogba receiving a letter from his brother urging him to hand over more money. Uh, his mother was put under pressure. Uh, the case became public at the start of September when uh, his brother, Matthias, uh, published uh, TikTok threatening to reveal the explosive releva- uh, revelations, the revelations being about Pogba getting on to the witch doctor to curse Mbappe. Uh, last week, his brother was arrested, extortion and belonging to a criminal gang were the charges. Others were arrested as well. And these are people like who are friends with him. So one of them stayed with Pogba for at least 18 months in Manchester. Their relationship ended when the player accused uh, this guy of using his credit card to take 200 grand from him. So the French media have painted five suspects, including Pogba's brother, as being parasites. Now there's a counterclaim that actually they're being pressured to take money from Pogba from another outside source. So it's almost somebody else getting them to pressure Pogba because... um, the sense is that they fear for their lives themselves, the people who are ex- taking the money from Pogba. Uh, French radio reported that Pogba has been paying childhood friends for years, investing in their restaurants, allowing them to use his credit card, Adidas account. Police believe the threat started when Pogba decided this year to stop paying them. So, you know, it's funny when we're watching Graham Souness criticise Pogba all these years. And yeah. That has not yeah. been the biggest concern in Paul Pogba's life. And how many other footballers go through things like this? Because yeah. they're so easily targeted, Joe. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking of little examples. Like, remember that time Mesut Ozil and Said Kozanak had to beat off 
a motorbike gang that tried to rob them. And there was another player recently, I think it was an Aston Villa player, who talked about beating off, beating off a couple of people as well. I mean, heaven knows how many of them are threatened with stuff like this off the court because they're, so we- they're so wealthy. Yeah, it's also it's not unusual. Targetable. It's also not unusual for a young, very wealthy footballer to be surrounded by hangers on mm-hmm. who are essentially employed to just be in his company. And so from the outset, that's, that's not unusual. But this goes to become stranger than fiction when you read about the witch doctor and, you know, Matthias's Twitter account is still active, it seems, on Friday. He was talking about um, messages claiming that his brother had colluded with organised crime to seek protection in the street. Now, Matthias was arrested last week, but his Twitter account is still active. So you wonder who's behind that. But... You know, it's James funny. Somebody got access to it, it, didn't he? It wouldn't be like unlike the French to give us this drama coming up to a major soccer tournament. That's for sure. Yes. And just watching France against Austria the other night and thinking of the players who were missing from that team, and they were exceptional. Well, that's they the thing. Really Benny, exceptional. You're making a good point about the World Cup where the football takes over. Yeah. Now, I know Pogba wasn't in the French squad, but there they were, full house, Stade de France, beating Austria two 0 It was like there was no problems. And the football so. It's so immune from all of this. And Mbappe Football still goes ahead. Uh, Mbappe, yeah. who is apparently on the wrong end of the witch doctor's uh, yes. intentions, was ridiculously good. Scored the other one, night. could have scored yeah, five. Just ridiculously good. So the French, the French story looks like it's going to be as melodramatic as ever. But you do, you do feel, and it's a very good point you make that Pogba, because of his underperformance with Manchester United, has become a kind of figure of ridicule mm. in the Premier League. Whereas we've seen a completely different Paul Pogba playing for France, winning the World Cup, and in his previous time with Juventus, um, he was an outstanding player. So he is this world-class footballer. But it does look like this utterly bizarre backdrop has been going on in his life for the last couple of years. And maybe it does explain his underperformance for Manchester United, that this was going on. Yeah. Mbappe says, I prefer to trust, trust the, word the word of a teammate. teammate. So he's, yeah. he's mm. trying to push mm. by it. Uh, David Walsh touches on this awful story from Australia. It's back page. He, he, he harks back to uh, some of the racism he witnessed when he was in Australia for the 2000 uh, Sydney Games. And then he talks about Hawthorne, who had this very successful uh, period. They won uh, four premierships from 08 to 15. But so the alleged wrongdoings, if you haven't heard the story, it was quite something. 2010 to 2016, uh, the two coaches involved have both stepped away. They're at different clubs now, but they've stepped away in light of the allegations. So in effect, what happened here is a report was done at Hawthorne and it was passed on to authorities, the AFL Integrity Unit, and then it was leaked to ABC and the journalist Russell Jackson. And so uh, the journalist spoke with some of the players at Hawthorne Aboriginal players who say their lives were ruined by decisions taken by senior staff. And I guess the most glaring story, Jerry, I know you read this piece, so mm. they don't give the real names here because no. it, it, it is very private. But the most shocking story, I suppose, is he tells the story of Ian and Amy, an Indigenous couple. Ian was with Hawthorne during their three in a row run at the Premiership. This is 2013 to 15. During that time, Amy became pregnant. Ian couldn't tell, wait to tell his coaches the good news. And then Russell Jackson, the journalist, says, Far from sharing his joy, Ian alleges that a group of coaches, including Alistair Clarks and Chris Fagan, ushered him into an office where he was urged to have the pregnancy terminated, get rid of his partner and move into the home of an assistant coach. So Ian says, It was so intimidating, confusing, upsetting. Clarkson just leaned over me, demanded that I needed to get rid of my unborn child and my partner. I was then manipulated and convinced to remove my SIM card from my phone so there was no further contact between my family and me. They told me I'd be living with one of the other coaches from that night onwards. Ian says he felt he had no choice. He told me to kill my unborn kid. In a state of shock and confusion, Ian phoned Amy, by then at work herself, and in a conversation that lasted only seconds, relayed information she could barely fathom. And uh, it's alleged the coaches and staff at Hawthorne tried to convince Amy that Ian had made the decision to end their relationship, but they wouldn't allow her to contact him. He says they didn't care. They just wanted him to... She says, rather, they didn't care. They just wanted him to move on from his family, focus only on football. Except for the names and stories uh, told to Jackson by multiple sources, uh, or uh, except for the names, rather, the stories told to Jackson by multiple sources speak of the same culture. Senior people at Hawthorne thought they were doing what was best for the club. It's insane. Yeah, it's really upsetting. It's horrible. Like, he, 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 Walty begins the piece with an anecdote about experiencing yeah. racism himself, but this guy comes into a cigarette shop 
where Walter, well, you've been going around trying to find out from people how they felt about the Olympic Games being in Sydney, and, and they were, he went to this shop where there was a second generation Australian of Indian extraction. His grandfather had moved to Australia, and this guy walks in off the street, buys a pack of cigarettes, and just flippantly says, um, "Effing shame, they have to have um, an abo light the flame," which um, is pretty. Cathy Freeman. And Cathy Freeman was the heroine of that, those Olympic yeah. Games and light the flame and won gold and just that, that, that kind of casual racing would exist. I suppose we all know it exists, unfortunately. Look at Atletico Madrid and their treatment of the Real Madrid players. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, this, now we, it should be stated that Clarkson and Fagan deny the charges, but both have stepped down from their current coaching roles. Mm -hmm. um, I think this has slipped off. And uh, as Walshie said, if it's, if it's proven, it was arrogance and racism of the worst kind. And I'm trying to think, what would be a punishment commensurate with the crime here if this is proven to be true? I don't know. I don't know if the um, recommended action to his partner was taken. I, we yeah. don't get those details, but, mm. um, I mean, it's hard to it, it, fathom what was going it, on it there. It is a reminder, because I was in Sydney for the Olympics in 2000, and it was all about Cathy Freeman. And, you know, we remember the night of Sonia and Zabo coming down the home straight, but that was the night of Cathy Freeman as well, winning the 400 metres. Mm. And if ever you were looking at a human being about to explode like a b light bulb from the pressure on, on her, it was Cathy, Cathy Freeman that night. And it was this symbolism of Aboriginals being respected more in Australia and, and a new beginning. And so you then read this story about Hawthorne and you realise that like so much of symbolism of past Olympics. It was shallow and empty. It was just optics, empty optics. Um, the detail in this is extraordinary, where you can actually tell someone that their partner must abort a baby and that, or you just cease to even communicate with your partner mm. in the interests of a football career. Um, and when you think of the mental issues that clearly this has now left behind on these people, it's it's shocking and it's it's uh, such a lack of um, human responsibility to the people in your care. Doesn't sport, as a, as a broader point, uh, like these most uh, egregious, serious issues, right through to concern about where a player is going to be in 30, 40 years time and, and where their body is going to be, isn't just the stark reality and we see that every turn. The professional sport doesn't care about anything except one thing. Winning. <laughs> and here we are. This, I mean, this is not from a 20, 30 year. This is not a, an old revelation. This is, no. this is, this is, yeah. this is modern sport. And it's, it's, it's a great point, Joe. And it's, 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 an, it's the same argument about dirty money in professional sport. Where yeah. do you draw the line? It's, there's dirty money right across professional sport. And I think we are entertained by professional sport on a, a kind of a superficial level where we don't really care enough mm about these stories, about what's going on. It's all about silverware. It's all about performance. And, you know, a lot of the time, if you look behind the scenes, there are, there are really sad and sordid stories going yeah. on. I do, because it's funny. I was doing I was in conversation um, with um, a former sports person and there was like a kind of, I guess, a, executives in the room and it was like, what can business learn from sport, you know? And this person was talking about the treatment of various managers to the players. And generally that treatment was like, Alex Ferguson-esque, you know, and one of the executives made the point, if I behaved, you know, if I behave like this in my office, HR on me, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to be fired. Mm. And the kind of the sense was, yeah, 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 I guess sport, you don't really do HR and we all kind of laugh. But then you kind of stop and think, maybe sport should be taking HR more seriously. Maybe sport should be monitoring how coaches speak to players and mm. what's going on. I think there's this general sense in sport that's not how a dressing room works, though, you know. Yeah, it's, it lives in a bubble with its own rules. And maybe it needs to grow out of that very yeah. quickly. Yeah, well, I think if you talk to Desi Farrell off the record, um, and Desi in his time involved with the GPA, he would tell you some horror stories. I'll bet. Of treatment of players by managers and some of the big names in, 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 in the GA. Yeah. Um, but the man management was just quite brutal and quite cold towards someone who was clearly having major off-field issues. Mm. Or even a young lad who can't train or might train, has an injury, doesn't want to say no to the coach. Like, there's, there's no HR person to go. Well, in fairness, he has an injury. No. Let's not pressure him to play. Yeah. And but part of his manager and coach is wanting to ensure that only the toughest survive because they yes. want the toughest in the dressing room. They want the toughest in their team. They want their toughest with five minutes to go in the drawn game or and, whatever. And to be fair, 
we here in the chattering classes mm. will be, you know, romanticising the player who was badly injured before the game and played through the pain barrier yeah. and did it anyway. So like, it's a weird world. We're part of it. Yeah. 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 This has been a thoroughly depressing <laughs> pay-per-view, by the way, at every turn. Um, so that's a uh, back page of the Sunday Times. I suspect that's going to be a big story for months to come. On the rugby front, a couple of interesting interviews. Paul Kimmage did stand for a very long chat with Graeme Rantry, who he's, he's met before, and, and they talk about Rantry's um, life, which we'll touch on in a moment. But Ben Healy, seeing as you had the Sunday Times open in front of you there, page 12, uh, very interesting check because we don't have a feel for Ben Healy the fly half at Munster and like there's a glut of fly halves at Munster and we're wondering who's going to emerge as the dominant force over the next decade and Peter O'Reilly sits down with him Munster playing today against Dragons and I suppose he, you, for, you know time moves on and you forget from one month to the next what happened in sport and so I guess the last time we really saw Ben Healy it was missing the penalty kicks in the Aviva Stadium in the Heineken Champions Cup knockout stages against Toulouse 40,000 people there and he missed his two kicks from the right hand side and uh, well he comes across as he would say himself Jerry, as an obsessive he didn't just take a summer holiday No he went to Michigan for a pre-season facility for NFL and NHL where he could work on his bulk and his kicking and everything else and then he reveals after this that he might be a bit too obsessive about the game it was very it was an interesting insight into him I'm a, I'm glad that we're seeing one-on-ones again. We say we don't know much about Ben Healy. We don't know much about any Irish rugby players around at the moment because there hasn't been one-on-one interviews for about two years because yeah. of COVID. Yeah. So to put that down in front of a screen full of journalists on a computer and, like, they're hardly going to reveal their innermost personalities, are they? No. So, but I'm not surprised that I've, I've interviewed Ben through a screen as well in a group interview and he's very articulate. He went to Glen Stahl, won the school senior cup there for the first time I think they ever won it. And um, he's a very interesting character and he, he's very candid about the, um, the penalty misses and the shootout against Toulouse, which must have been heartbreaking for him. You, very you, revealing the way he talked about Peter Armani coming in just sitting beside him yes. in the dressing room just for 10 minutes saying nothing. Were you surprised for all the preparation that goes into these situations? So, so off the cuff, who's going to kick from where? I, I was staggered. Staggered. So It's like not doing a penalty shoot, or like not even making plans for it. Joey Carberry, Conor Murray, you'll remember, were the other kickers. Yeah. So how is it that he was on the right-hand side taking two shots from the more difficult angle? He and volunteered for it. Ah, he says, it was between myself, Joey and Conor. Conor isn't a regular kicker. It made sense that he'd take the ones from the middle. I just put my hand up in the huddle and said I'd take the kicks from the right if everyone was happy with that. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's very haphazard, isn't it? It should that's, be better prepared than that's that. That's very poor. That's yeah, very poor. I would have thought so. I, um, I appreciate in rugby injuries are complex you don't know who might be left on the pitch but I mean that Ben Healy didn't know the week of the game mm-hmm. if it goes to a shootout he should practice a few of these from the right hand yeah, side yeah. because he said he, he does now know the technical reason he missed both those kicks yeah. maybe yeah. he would have known for the game Yeah. I thought yeah. like look Van Graan's gone now and that's done but it's I mean done, yes he's having a tough time at Bath at the moment um, I'd, I'd be surprised if Leinster for instance if they're the touchstone in Irish rugby at the moment went into a penalty shootout and couldn't tell you before the game who's kicking from where it would very be surprising. surprising. Yeah, it would be surprising. It's very revealing, though, isn't it? Like, it, well, it must have been a traumatic day, the most traumatic day of his career. Yeah. And he's been quite revealing about the whole process and what he went through and what he experienced afterwards and how he was able to cope with it. Um, like, when he first broke into the Munster team, was at the start of two seasons ago, he basically built his rep on being a clutch kicker From with very little else yeah. to his game. Right. And he morphed under Larkham's influence into this much more complete at half playing on the game <clears throat> with a really good passing game. He's really, I thought he'd been one of the most improved players, probably the single most beneficiary of Larkham's time at Munster. But now he's moving on with Mike Prendergast. He's talking about the next few weeks. He's not going on this Emerging Ireland tour, but he's talking about the, the upcoming derbies. Yeah. There's a match against South Africa in midweek when he was at the one in 2008 when Joe Akogoko scored the late try to beat the All Blacks. So I think he's, and it's also interesting to talk See about the money he was offered by the Scots and the big job he was offered by Gregor Townsend because mm. he actually qualifies for Scotland through his maternal grandmother, I think, mm. and how he wants to stay at Munster. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a it's a good piece by Peter O'Reilly. It's a, it's a revealing interview. Yes, when he was in Michigan, by the way, as well as putting on some bulk, he did a psychometric test, which basically suggested you're far too obsessed with rugby <laughs> and go and do something else. So he, he's spending time on the farm to try and get away from yes. it. So um, mm. who's going to emerge as the Munster number ten? in the next couple of years with Healy and Joey Carberry and various other Jack Crowley will probably still have an eye on it. Who do you think is going to come out? A lot of good ones. They had to let Jake Flannery go and they let JJ Hanron go and they've still got three good ones there. Like Flannery's a class player. Like you are not... um, They're all class players actually. But I think that uh, 
I know Carberry's the man in pole position. He's the position, man in pole position. But... So therefore you would say he's the favourite still to retain the number 10 jersey because he is the man in pole position. Like, one thing about Joey Carberry is, might, might not be widely known, Ireland have beaten the All Blacks five times in the last eight meetings. And he's seen out all five wins. You know? Yeah. There's this perception that Joey's not up to it because mm. Johnny is so brilliant. You're like, now he's coming damn close to perhaps even superseding Brian O'Driscoll as our greatest ever rugby player. You know what I mean? Pretending what he does in the last year and a bit of his career. And it's very unfair for any out-half to be compared. It would be a bit like comparing a number 13 to Brian during the height of his powers. It must have been difficult for 13s around. But Joey's, I think Joey's a very good player and he's close out those five wins, I've said. And I would still make him the favourite to be the monster number 10. But Healy's improved immeasurably and Crowley is a player you just want to watch play. Just wouldn't see him get on the ball. Mm. Like he, I watched him play for Cork Con in an AIL semi final. He came off the bench in, against Clontarf in a losing cause. But he just lit up the game every time he touched the ball. He's just, he could beat a man in a telephone box. I guess if Ron O'Gara saw enough in him yep. to say, come over to La Rochelle, mm. there's something there. Mm. Uh, Graham Rentry, it's like a four page piece with Paul Kimmage, several thousand words. Um, they chart his whole career really in the Castle Troy Park Hotel. And, you know, he's interested in a whole bunch of things. Definitely his happiness to be in. Limerick comes through, uh, talks about Martin Johnson in glowing terms and his time with Johnson both as a fellow player and also working as part of the coaching ticket where, you know, you, this piece reminded me that only Rowntree really came out of the post-World Cup report with any real credit and that was the reason he was uh, kept on and talks about the different attitude in Munster to Leinster and uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how he, how he goes at Munster. So that is a four-page piece, probably wouldn't quite do it justice trying to pick our way uh, through it, but Munster fans will be interested in that. Clock is against us. There's a piece in page 18 of the Sunday Times wondering if Paul O'Donovan could well be Ireland's greatest ever sports person. He seems to be in the conversation. And then, um, well, further to our point that the football will win out when it comes to the World Cup. Jerry Thornley, you uh, read Jonathan Wilson, back page of The Observer, and he is um, wondering if Messi at this improbable third World Cup might just do it. Yeah, this is um, a bit of bias for me because I read The Observer every Sunday. I love The Observer as a newspaper, not just for a sports section. The real treat is when you finally get through all the sports pages, maybe get into a little bit of news and world news towards the end of a Sunday down in my local. But I love The Observer. I love it. Wilson. He's a superb writer. He's a very prolific um, book writer. He has yeah. a broad, broad knowledge of global football. Um, his pieces are technical but really well written. And he's just written this piece again, like this is con almost contradictory to what we were, I was saying earlier about Messi, um, how four years ago it looked like, but 2018, that would be the last he dance. He's 31. He's 31. But here we are four years later. Argentina, I didn't, I'd forgotten they beat Brazil at the Maracanã to win the Copa America last year. Yeah, I remember the scenes, the and tears, they, Messi lifting a trophy. Yeah, and yeah. it was their first trophy in 28 years. So that's timely. He's talking about his brilliant form now at Paris Saint-Germain. Mm. He's talking about um, Argentina are now on is it a 34-game unbeaten run. But yes. the caveat, and I didn't realise this, is that there is frustration in Argentina that the UEFA Nations League um, denies them both variety and quality of opponents. The 3-0 win against Honduras extended Argentina's unbeaten run to 34 games, and they should move a step closer to Italy's record of 37 against Jamaica on Tuesday. But Argentina's run includes just four games against non-Latin American sides. Well, That's this, a real handicap for them. This World Cup is now a, a throwback to when yes. South American sides didn't play European yes. sides except for the World Cup. Yep, it's got a bit of an, almost a novelty value again back yeah. instead of that familiarity that we certainly get in rugby because it's a much more limited global cast list. But he's making the point that, yeah, this could be it, that um, they were really impressive when they beat Italy at Wembley 3-0 during the summer. I saw that game as well. Um, and he just thinks that um, they have a style now, they have a confidence, they would have liked more exposure to high-level European opposition, but the dream of Messi's glorious finale is very much alive. That'd be some story, wouldn't it? Yes. It'd be wonderful, because I, I know you're, I think I'm right in saying your favourite player is Maradona. Yep. And, uh, Who he's always compared to. Yeah, always compared to. And he, Messi, is, in my view, the greatest player I've ever seen just for the longevity, the consistency, and the fact that the age he is, and he's now doing it at PSG, and that this article is presenting this possibility yeah. that this may be the Messi World Cup at this stage of his career. Um, and it's, it's interesting. He, I've always felt that Argentina doesn't quite appreciate Messi the way the rest of the world does. That, to me, what he has done over the years, 
at Barca particularly was just ridiculous. And I personally would love to see them do it because because of him. Mm. I I think he is just extraordinary. And to and and to think at this time of his career, when you saw him going to P- Paris, you kind of think, ah, it's money. It's all about money, and this is the kind of farewell kind of tour, if you like. And no, he's still doing it. Mm. He's still he's still digging in and and winning games for them. And uh, it's it's a romantic story, but that caveat that they really haven't measured up against European opposition means you don't really know what that unbeaten run stands means, for. Yeah, I saw him once live in Argentina. A couple of colleagues were on a rugby tour, and we went to see Argentina play Costa Rica in Buenos Aires. And there were like three different um, checkpoints along the way with the military. You couldn't bring in, <laughs> someone, you couldn't barely bring in a glass of water. Although once you got inside the um, the smell of weed was pretty noticeable. <laughs> but um, any time Messi got the ball, the whole crowd were just enraptured. Yeah. And he cruised through the game. They won 2 or 3 nil. But you could sense that he is a god. I was surprised a little bit because I wasn't sure whether they did get him. They do love him. They do love him. Messi, Messi, Messi. The chants are continuous, just continuously chanted his name. Mm. So I think, Finney's right, I think a, a lot of Irish football fans would buy into that narrative as well. I think mm. they could be mm. a, a favourite team for a lot of Irish football fans because of Messi. Just before we wrap up, there's been a vote today as to who runs the IABA. And um, Sean McGoldrick preempted this. I want to grab people with the headline here because this gets very dense. And uh, in effect, it's about Russian money uh, corrupting the IABA. And the Olympic Council are saying, well, look, you can't be involved with some of these people. But the net result, Vincent, and we'll do a piece on it later on, is that there's a very real probability now, not a possibility, there's a very real probability that boxing won't be at the LA Games in 2028 as a result of this vote this morning, mm. which is a wild, staggering thought. This is a huge story for us, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, when you think of, I think since the High Performance Unit was set up in 2003, we've got nine Olympic medals through boxing. And you're right, Kremlev's re-election is basically the two fingers of the IOC by the IBA. Um, and it's them saying that despite everything that's going on at the moment, Gazprom money, Russian support, and bear in mind we had two world gold medalists um, this year in the World Championships, and they both got 100,000 euros, I think, Mm -hmm. was it? That's life-changing money. So the the, the line between professional and amateur boxing is completely blurred blurred by this, and by this Russian money that's coming into that, amateur boxing, as we call it, and it's, you know, you think of, you know, Lisa Rourke and, and I can't think of the other g- woman who, mm. who who won, but that's life changing. That You can pay off a big chunk of your mortgage with that kind of money. So the IBA has basically said, we're not going to be told how to conduct our business by the IOC. Yeah. And the IOC right now has said there'll be no boxing in Los Angeles. So we will have it in Paris, but not in Los Angeles. And right now, that looks like it's it's not just a bluff. It looks like this is going to happen. Yeah, it's hard to... But Sean, yeah, Sean McGoldrick has a long piece explaining the IBA stuff that's been going on for the last couple of years, which is extraordinary. It's worth reading. Sean mm. has been on top of this story mm. from the get-go. And uh, do you know what? Um, it's a huge story for Irish sport. Mm. I know. Uh, fellas, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Jerry Thorney of the Irish Times, Vincent Hogan of the Irish Independent. Much appreciated. That was great, fellas. Thank you. Cheers, Joe. Pleasure. Cheers, Joe.